Welcome back, everybody. Our next speaker is Ashish Sharma. Uh, he runs Bro! Exclamation point. He loves it. <laughs> and in all the years he's been using Bro, he says he still hasn't figured out all that he can do in Bro. Uh, so he just keeps on running it. And we're going to listen to his talk about defending, <laughs> actively defending so you can do other stuff. Welcome, Ashish. Sure. Is it, is it unmuted? Yeah. OK. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, this is a good time, uh, a post-lunch talk. So if you like the talk, good. If you sleep, thank me. So uh, let's see. So basically, my, me and my wife work in two very different fields. So I try to just impress her every time I, I get a chance. And she asked me this question sincerely, like, uh, why do bro guys still let you talk? <laughs> so, and I found it very challenging and offensive. So this is what I came up with. <laughs> so basically, provide dynamic firewall capabilities of bro. And we continue to keep the network open, unrestricted, and let's see, let people do what they are doing while protecting and keeping the bad guys out. So uh, the way I thought of, oh, and this is what she actually said. This is a simple idea. So you, when, when you find something to block, you just block it. So that is how the interaction works in my house. So, uh, so this talk actually is for three different sets of people. One is, uh, just new people who are very new to Bro, I want to, like, by end of the talk, want to like, create this confidence in you that you can rely on Bro for doing things, like bl putting automatic blocks on the router or doing, like, going a little beyond a normal uh, patience or normal tolerance level. The second level is like, uh, the people who are already doing this actually would just like, uh, find it not very entertaining or very enthusiastic uh, approach here. But uh, I want to convey, like, this is how we do things. Maybe we share the notes, learn what you're doing better, and then adopt it. The third thing is for the bro team. There are these subtle hints, like, when the reaction framework comes in, uh, this is my wish list. So get you guys an idea, get you, like, what's going on. So here are the desired goals when it comes down to building a system which actually detects badness in the network, blocks on the router, keeps the bad guys out. Uh, it does all kinds of this active reaction uh, strategies. So what we want is a reliability. Redundancy in the system. You don't want the system to be offline, and then all of a sudden all the doors are open, bad guys are hitting you, or you don't want it to be like very flaky in sense. You, we want accountability. We want. Uh, uh, Basically, accuracy, we are blocking the bad guys only. We are not blo blocking like a grid FTP transfer, just thinking that this is a port scan going on. Fast reaction times. So, and then, of course, this thing is also there. Like, OK, you want to block really fast scanners. At the same time, you want to block really slow scanners who have been like hitting you over days with like a very low threshold. Same thing for your tool, ACLD, which was written by Craig Laris. So the tool actually, like when the tool gets the information from Bro, how fast it actually acts on it. it. Does it take one minute per ACL transaction? Does it take microseconds? So that makes a lot of difference as well. And then smart ACL management, state management. So these are the desired goals of this particular system. And uh, these are some of the things uh, I picked up, cherry picked up basically for showcasing here, like what are the active mechanisms? So scan detection is the primary one. So uh, at LBL, we are running both old scan detection policies from 153 world, which got ported to like 2.1, 2.2 world, and the new scan detection policies, which are pretty cool, based on the some stats framework, allows you to do a lot more things too. Then there is this thing, like for lack of better word, uh, I call it deep blocks, and by that I mean is like the blocks which actually are based on the decisions after you inspect a little bit inside the protocol, for example, in HTTP or like DNS protocol, if user agents, for example, is there. Uh, in IRC traffic, if you see some things, like for example, connections to internet, then you automatically block it quickly. So you go within the protocol, see the things. Then there are application-specific blockings, like NTP scan, the big NTP issue came up. It's like, okay, we need to block these guys. We won't need to block them. Heartbleed was another one the SIP scanners, then Intel framework, we are not quite blocking them, we are counting 
like we could have blocked these many things or we could have blocked it these many times, but we don't do it. And the, the logic is simple. We cannot really trust the data we get right now. The intelligence data is not worthy enough to be like blindly used for blocking. But the mechanism is there, the infrastructure is there. Instead of blocking, we just give a, we get a count. And then are some similar things. So this is the high level overview of the uh, blocking infrastructure or the LBL network. Uh, what this basically shows is that uh, okay, ENS, ESNet is our internet. They are our network provider. So we have tabs running outside the external router and inside the external router. So uh, there has been like different schools of thought. Why would you want to do it? So the first thing is redundancy. So we definitely want redundancy. Second is visibility. Let's say we block something here. This, is, this guy is not going to see it if it's an ACL block. But we still see things here. So we kind of know like who is hammering us, what's going on. Uh, uh, as far as uh, the noise on the internet, which we want not to see anymore. So and then we have internal routers. We have tabs here, which we call like the internal clusters. They are strategically located at different subnets in the network, like in front of the mail server, in front of the DNS server, DHCP server, uh, radius server. So all those work as a worker node. And then they actually send data to like subnet.bro. But uh, 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 so this gives us a pretty decent visibility overall in the network. And these are different things which actually block. So like you can see, like bro is one thing which blocks, but then we block with FireEye as well. We use syslog server, which goes to bro, goes to ACLD. ACLD is the daemon which actually implements the blocking. So uh, we, like we don't block with time machine, but we just run that. So, so but yeah, this is a very high level overview of what we do. So catch and release, I think you guys have heard this uh, or maybe seen this slide before as well. This is a system initially written by Jim Melander from Berkeley Lab. And then I added so many things on it that I think I can comfortably feel talking about it now. So it's an ACL management system. The idea here is that this is really what creates the dynamic firewall at the lab. So we have scan detection. We have different policies running. They find something bad, generate a notice. We decide that th that particular notice is worthy of dropping. So it actually sends it to the drop.bro, the catch and release part of the bro. And uh, uh, it would actually trigger the block. Uh, and it works as a reaction framework for us. And the theory here is like there is no point blocking something if they are not uh, uh, affecting us anymore. So let's say an IP comes and scans us. They scan us for four seconds. We block them. We block them for a day. There's no point keeping them blocked if they just go away. So this is basically the premise here. So uh, what this system allows us is actually to expire the stale blocks. There is no point leaving this block for 30 days when they are not touching us. And then previously, we had very limited ACLs. Like, I think 8,000, then 10,000 grew to 50,000, grew to 150,000. Now they say. 500,000 uh, or a million uh, or something like that. But the deal is the way we are growing, uh, blocking things, it's actually it's just keeping up with the increase, too. So uh, catch and release also allows us to actually make uh, scan detection heuristics very sensitive. Uh, let's say we have blocked somebody. They go away. They come back later after a week. We still have a state of this particular IP. We have a story of this IP. We don't wait for them to hit 50 more times or hit 50 different machines in the network. You see a few connections, you know the history, you block them immediately. And then there is this uh, dynamic blocking and expiration timer. So if you are repeatedly coming here, you will just keep getting incrementally blocked. So if you just like us too much, we don't like you too much too. So we'll keep you blocking for like one week, three weeks, one month, six months, so on and so forth. And it's pretty much. Uh, uh, catch and release takes care of the timer. So this is, uh, uh, so I thought it would be a good idea to show bro code throughout the presentation. So uh, slide one. So this is actually just uh, basis of the catch and release drop function. So this is where it actually just checks like, OK, what's the persistent uh, offender time? And then you can define multiple time periods, like a short drop duration, long drop duration. Here, what we are doing is like you calculate the total drop time as an increment of whatever time we are dropping. And he, this is pretty much static right now. But you can always do is like t plus uh, another variable. And that would make it pretty dynamic right there. So now this is the same diagram expanded a little more. 
And I, it's sorry, it's a complicated diagram. It's too loaded. But I wanted to like show you something little inside. So we have tabs outside the external router, tabs inside the external router. And uh, one question is like, okay, can uh, the bro system running all this uh, uh, mechanisms be able to handle a 10 gig link, which is what we are running currently? And what happens when we move to 100 gig link? So, so there are little clever strategies we start using. One of them is we actually filter, we use a BPF filter to send the traffic to these standalone box, bro, bro boxes. So this reduces a lot of uh, uh, data which we don't really care about and it's not helpful to make a decision in blocking here. So, and then of course we have two DMZ boxes and this is again for redundancy purpose. So uh, if this one fails, this one still is living. Uh, and same thing is internal here. We have internal DMZ1 and DMZ2. So all these boxes are actually running scan detection script. Uh, old scan and new scan running together. They are quite happy running simultaneously. On uh, scan detection actually talks to drop.bro. It says, okay, this is a bad IP. Take care of it. It goes into the catch and release hell. That's what we call. And from there, it actually uses exec framework, which is really good uh, addition. Uh, to, like, I think since Bro 2.1, it actually is really helpful. And that would call two different scripts, like either do a null zero routing or uh, implement a restore of a null zero route. So if Bro decides that this is not useful anymore and we don't uh, are interested in this IP at all now, we would restore the IP, we'll free it up. So exec framework actually would take care of it. Now we are extremely sensitive about blacklist. So these are the different mechanisms which are uh, built around the system so that we know that we don't goof up uh, or make mistakes. So the blacklist actually goes uh, via Intel framework, which actually uses input framework, into bro boxes. And bro actually takes this blacklist, looks at the table, and tries to make decision there. Let's say this fails somewhere. So we still have another blacklist instance here. Uh, so when the scripts run, they actually check against the same blacklist and make sure that we do not unblock an IP which is on a blacklist and they have to be permanently blocked. So these are different protection mechanisms we try to put in. Again, redundancy in the system, failures, making mistakes, and so on and so forth. Uh, they then bro talks to the ACLD. ACLD has a whitelist in built there. So uh, it won't be a good story where uh, all of a sudden bro blocks uh, google.com. And that happened because uh, external feed thought google.com is a bad uh, domain name. So ACLD has list of IP addresses, domains, uh, where it's like, okay, do not ever block these ones. So, so that is taken care of here. So it, that's another protection mechanism. One more thing we actually do is have all these different log instances. So we have scan, like notice.log, everybody's familiar with that. Then there is a drop.log, and then when exec framework runs, it creates its own logs. And then we have a debug log, which actually is created by the scripts running. So just in case, uh, if there is a failure, we can know where in this particular chain the failure happened. So, so that kind of uh, is really useful. This is actually an output of drop.log. And what it shows is just the timestamp, what was the IP, what was the action taken. So here is all these drops happening. There is one restore happening here. Uh, what particular... Uh, policy file was used, like this is address scan, so somebody was just scanning, this is ICMP scan happening here. And then uh, restores basically are like, okay, we are done with the expiration of the timer, let's just restore. Uh, what are the ports active? Uh, the count actually is the number of counts. Now look at the 10, that is the reason why my code doesn't get accepted into Bro. So 10 is an arbitrary number which I kept in there just in case, like, so this are, these are the first timers. So instead of like putting a zero, I have like 10 there, and I'm just like, this was a debugging, and this code has been running for a year, two years now. So uh, this actually is the timer. So for example, here, 172, 800, this is the amount of seconds this particular drop has been active for, and the increment was a day. So basically, just gives you a little bit idea, like, okay, well, how does a drop dot log look like? Now, uh, this actually is connection logs everybody is very familiar with. This was a scan going on. Uh, 23 TCP, I'll show you some very interesting things about this scan. But uh, like it's a little slow scanner, 213.08 hits. So there's a chunk of data here to which I didn't paste limitations of sc a screen. But somewhere around 243.27, after this, between these two connections, Bro decided that this actually has scanned 
host on uh, 23 TCP and it wants to block. So uh, remember one of the desired goals was redundancy and other one was fast response time. So somewhere here it bro decides it and then ACLD talks to, like bro talks to ACLD, the entire pipeline which I showed you in the previous screen. And uh, this is where the ACLD log comes in. So it's pretty much instantaneously. Bro decides it, sends it to ACL, ACL looks at it, implements the block. These are the times which actually are ACL times. So ACLD got it at like 360 milliseconds, microseconds, and then at 412, which is like I think 62 microseconds later, it actually finished the transaction. So, so this gives us really fast response time. And th there is one more thing, accountability. Like, these are the logs which go to the system log. So we want to see, like, okay, why did we block this IP when people complain, hey, I am blocked? Why did we block it? So the idea was to actually take the notice log, uh, where is it, this line here, and ship it all the way to the syslogs from ACLD. So this is where it ends up. So when people, like non-security team people, look at the ACL logs and try to figure out why this IP was blocked, the message actually goes. So it kind of gives you an accountability of what was going on in the story. So, so that is scan detection. It actually goes a lot more in depth, uh, but uh, uh, if you guys feel like just catch me offline, we'll talk in details about what inter internal uh, tricks are there in the scan detection system we are employing. But so this is a D HTTP deep blocking. So this is basically, there are these URLs. We don't like those URLs. Somebody tries to you, you send that URL to us. And then, uh, well, uh, seems like somebody here actually already tried this. So, <laughs> so yeah. <laughs> Well, okay, this was my live demo too, for example, okay? It worked, so I got a page when somebody went to block me. <laughs> so allegedly it works, so. Uh, so the idea is actually like take this URL string and then say, okay, I don't like it, and we block it. And this was the example. Uh, so, the, but all not URLs are worthy blocking. Some of them are like, okay, I want to notice on this one. So it's like, okay, I want, uh, so we break into watched URIs as well as sensitive URIs. This one gets a notice drop. Again, the pipeline is, the policy says notice drop, goes to drop.bro, it's now worthy of dropping, drop.bro takes an action on it, uh, talks to the ACL, puts the block, keeps a timer, sees when do we want to release it. Now, the strategies are different for expiration. Uh, I think I, I don't have a slide for that, so I'll just talk. Uh, AC, uh, sorry, catch and release actually knows the timer management for scan blocking. But for deep blocking, we actually don't let bro go and unblock. We just leave them blocking for a while. And then we decide like, okay, this is a, a good time, maybe a week later or 10 days later, we would go and unblock them. But once we unblock, they get blocked. So whoever actually went to this, I'm sure like if you go to any other LBL site, you won't be able to access it now. Well, that gives you enough time to digest on what I, uh, okay, yeah. Do you have, uh, how do you handle issues if someone is blocking or behind the IP? That is a big problem. That is actually a problem. And we would, I'm sorry? Oh, how do we handle the blocking for an IP which is behind a NAT? So we would block the NAT, and then we will get complaints from the people. <laughs> so. Uh, and this happens more often. Actually, NAT is not that big of a problem. There are certain universities, so we have whitelisted their NAT space, and we have whitelisted their machines, which actually are getting repeatedly blocked. But the bigger problem we see is actually people when they go to a conference. So there is like 15 people from LBL, they'll go to conference, they'll connect from the uh, conference network, and all of a sudden, all of these connections are coming to the lab. Bro thinks it's a scan, they get blocked. So we have a mechanism to handle that. Whenever people go to conference, the lab, lab people are know enough now that they will actually give us the address space to whitelist for the duration of the conference. So, so that uh, is kind of like built in the system. Otherwise, it's like, okay, I am blocked, unblock me. So, sure. Hello. There ah. How do you deal with carrier grade NAT? Uh, like uh, uh, de definition carrier grade NAT. This is a a device that sits at the carrier's edge that provides a double natting. The device itself changes ports and IPs every few minutes within a range. 
Okay, so the best way to deal with them is just hear them complain. <laughs> so no, it's tricky. It's the trick. The accuracy part is like, can we figure out that this is actually a scam? So if they are doing a scan, we will block them. We will not hesitate. But yep. the question is like, if their their behavior turns out to be a scan, which actually is not a scan, then we have to revisit. Like, if we see complaints like this coming up, we would go revisit what inside the scan policy flagged this thing. What the issue is is that the source address and the source port changes on a random basis. So far, I don't, even if we have blocked either, I have never noticed this issue, or we haven't really come across this as a scan. Talk to me later. So. But yeah, no, this, this is there. Like, uh, we have systems in place because people get blocked and you have to go and unblock them. Yes, your question? So this is a two-part question. If you see um, a malicious IP address, do you do, say, a who is on it? And if you do do who is, and it turns out to be from another educational institution, will you send them just a courtesy email saying, hey, this machine might be compromised? That's a good question. We have to deal with it often. So we don't do who is at all. Like we would block the IP, but later on there is another built-in protection mechanism. Like whatever we are blocking, we scrutinize it. Like okay, this was blocked. Why was this blocked? And if they are a EDU or they are a GOV, we would actually contact them. So we would take the pains, send them an email, follow up with them. If we don't know EDU, we use RENASEC, <coughs> which is really phenomenal to get in touch with a lot of EDU people. So, so this is uh, actually like some internals in the deep block. So here is the sensitive URI, here is the watched URI, here is the page URI. And these are some of the protections. I just wanted to show the protections in the place. So like all the scan hosts, they are actually part of the LBL module in the bro. So if you are a scan IP, which could be anywhere from lab systems to Amazon, or so they won't get blocked if you are actually no, not in local nets, then basically you will get an action drop. So there is little more sophistication here. We actually consider our neighbor nets as well. So uh, like other enclaves, ESnet, NERSC, we would actually warn on them but rather than block on them. So, <clears throat> but again, same thing. This is the notice. This is for block me. It actually goes and uh, if you go on certain URIs, it would actually trigger a block. This is what would go into the ACLD logs, again, for accountability. Somebody, the third party, like help desk, actually looks at these. And they say, OK, you are blocked for this reason. And this, this, so the same notice message ends up going here. And it's like, OK, did you do this? And generally, the fun part here is when the external consultants or external curious pen testers or like some people who are hired by a different group, they try to do things. And they're like, no, I did not scan. It's like, no, you did. <laughs> and, and that's where, so, but often help desk takes care of this part. So, oh, so, so this is now uh, application specific block. So Heartbleed is one. So Joanna, I mean, I cannot thank you for the Heartbleed. This was like next. I would have had awesome story, but the talk was already done yesterday. So, <laughs> uh, but I still like uh, thought, 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 and last night came up with like, what can I show here? So this is important. So this is April 8, around 6, 10 in the evening. We were actually using the Heartbleed policy and blocking uh, with Bro real time. So, and this kind of shows like, okay, this was the initial comment which was going in, then later on this was the version, and now it's actually this. So the policy, this gives you an idea about like the evolution of the policy. But I think around like 2 o'clock in the night, it actually became a very stable branch and we actually were kicking blocks left and right after that. So this was just a block, like uh, there is this big hard bleed issue, we need to do something about it, blocking is one of the ways to deal with it. So another thing was NTP scan, same story. Uh, I, I, almost all of you guys are familiar with the NTP problem. Like, there was huge NTP scan going on, so we said, okay, let's block this. How do we do it? So we went for, like, this is where Bro actually is really good. You, you like Bro that, that, on these days. So there are other days when you don't, but. Uh, <laughs> so, so here, this was ready-made. There was an event NTP message. I did not know about it. But it's like, okay, let's go, let's look at it. You find this message, you say, okay, if it's not control, if it's not private, return. Otherwise, here is the precise string which we would use to create an NTP block. So, so this actually uh, started doing, so the example here is that, okay, 
at 22.29.09, we actually saw a monolith query. So we actually knew what is the nature of this scan, and this is worthy of blocking, we blocked it. At the same time, Bro saw it too as a, uh, has scanned X number of hosts. I just, I don't know why I did that. Uh, so at 23 UDP. So this could be anywhere from like 30, 50, 100 hosts. So uh, old address scan, this was. So Bro actually flagged this as a scan, but we blocked it a lot before. So this is 2925. We blocked it at 09 because we knew what is the nature of the scan. So, but one of the things we try to do at the lab is like uh, the Christmas tree analogy. Like your alerts should light up like a Christmas tree. So then you know where in this attack uh, attacker is uh, at when we are actually taking certain action or detecting it. So attacker can go from point A to B and like play a trick and subvert us. But we might actually get an alert from when the transition is from B to C or C to D. So here there were two alerts. We tried to see if we can do uh, catch something multiple times. So. So this is blacklist and intel feeds. A very brief uh, uh, touching on this because we don't really block it. We want to, but the theory is like 99% of the uh, data is useless because of 1% of the false positives in the feed. So you you cannot take automated action on it. And especially like when the feed comes uh, from third parties, they don't tell you like they always say it's third party, and then you really don't know if it's actionable intelligence on which I block, and then I actually. Uh, fight with the people complaining about it. So we leave this at uh, monitor stage. So for example, here is this IP, which was actually, so uh, one fun policy was just write, okay, how many notices this particular IP generates or particular uh, thing generates? So this one generated 25 notices. So it's like, okay, we have blocked this. This is a blacklisted IP. Now it's hitting us. It has hit us and generated 25 events, which Bro thinks is problematic. So uh, these numbers go like to crazy, like 500,000 at times. So that helps like, okay, somebody's really hitting us and we, we did something good here, or it's a false positive. Like why would you have a blacklisted IP which is hitting us you a lot of time? So this is the way we are trying to filter out like, okay, what can we do about it? So, uh, but here is the wish list again. So uh, uh, one, another feature is like, okay, we are running four standalone bros. You actually, uh, block n number of IP addresses. Now you restart bro. Does bro forget about all those IP addresses? Does bro remember those IP addresses? What happens when external bro actually is restarted and internal bro is also doing the same thing? So it becomes, so we want a persistence uh, to be there, like persistence of the state. So when bro restarts, bro should know that this was the history which it had been uh, doing what it had been doing, and now this is what it has to do. It has to restore the IPs which were blocked two weeks back, or it has to do something else. So again, like uh, we would like the ability to add new heuristics very fast. So one was, uh, Heartbleed was an example. It's like, okay, can we just immediately block it? Like all we needed to do was, NT, uh, sorry, Heartbleed attacker scene. So if you see this, configure notice drop. Rest should be transparent. It should be basically notice drop takes care of rest of the story. I don't have to like say, okay, I want to pass it to this function and do this thing and that thing. And it's transparent to a level that it goes all the way to the ACLD logs to the syslog. So again, identifying the false positive. So like for blacklisted IP address, it's like, okay, how many alerts this particular IP would generate to us? But at the same time, like little sensitive towards .gov, .edu. So we would do extra effort to go and look at the IPs and see if it's an EDU, okay, we have to take more action, talk to the people. Uh, often EDUs actually are compromised, they are scanning us, and then it's like, okay, hey, here's a compromised machine. Other times it's like uh, a NAT. And then we have to work with their, their team and then get a good idea about it. So this is an interesting policy. I, I really liked Input framework, once I started working on this policy, input framework is extremely powerful. It's just uh, awesome. So uh, what, uh, what was this policy? This was like, okay, we get a list of N thousand IP addresses every hour, and we have to block them. And once we block them, the IPs change next hour again. So the uh, deltas could be anywhere from like a couple of hundred to maybe 2,000 IPs. So all of a sudden you have 2,000 IPs which are not in the list, and another 1,000 IPs got added to the list. So uh, the theory was like, okay, let's block everything. So every hour the ACL transaction was like, okay, you block 8,000 IP addresses, you unblock 2,000 IP addresses, you block again another. It was just not good. 
So we said, OK, we are going to do it the bro way. So again, the idea was, like, if there is no point blocking an IP if it doesn't connect to you. Like, let, let them be around. So and uh, uh, no pl pl point unblocking an IP which you haven't blocked or you don't care about. So, so this was it. So we said, OK. And there was another problem. So like, we really start for uh, re redundancy, reliability. All the four bro boxes are there. External DMZ, internal DMZ. The, now the problem comes is these bros fight with each other. They want to block more. So they want to compete with each other. So like, can we do this fourth level of blocking while keeping the rest of the bros independent? Like we don't want to deal with And I'll actually go in details about that story. So this is an ugly diagram, but it actually is a good diagram for the sense that this part here, the green part, is the input framework. So what we did is we took the list of IP addresses every hour. Very transparent, the list changes, input framework detects all these things, generates three events, new, removed, modified. So we take that. If it's a new IP, we just populate a table called bad IP list. If it's a removed IP, we say if it's not blocked by uh, anybody, then we restore it, and then it's good day. If it's blocked, then basically we say, OK, it's, uh, uh, so this IP would be restored by somebody else, and then generate a notice. So we do that. But this is where the bro. Uh, IDS part or the network part comes in. So there is, I, right now I only have one event connection established, but there are a bunch of events I am actually tapping into. Uh, when this event happens, just simple check. If this is part of that bad list, if it is, drop it. Uh, if the drop ACL returns like two or one, which are different codes, then it's like existing or a failure, and then it goes through it. So if it's an existing drop, which means that the IP is bad, it's blacklisted in sense, we don't want them to touch us. But bro actually already has dropped it. So this system waits for bro to release it. Uh, so it can happen that bro actually dropped it as a scanner. The timer expired. Bro released the IP. Now the IP is open. But that IP touched us. So what this script does is it actually constantly just tries to keep blocking after an amount of time. Just in case if the release happens, let's put the block back in as long as the IP is in this list. So. So it actually works pretty well. It's a very seamless thing. It actually peacefully coexists with others. So this is, uh, OK, so we are blocking. Like The favorite question is, like, how many things do you block? <laughs> so this is what we are blocking since 19 July, so last 30 days. Uh, so unique IP addresses per day. And this is not cumulative graph. I'll show you the cumulative graph. So these are, like, <laughs> these are the new IPs. We have not seen this IP yesterday. So if it was seen yesterday, it would have been blocked already. So, but do you guys see this here? So this is actually, you woke up on like 12th morning, and you see this 54,365 unique IPs, which actually just emerged overnight. So, and this was going on for last few days. What it is, maybe you guys can tell me. It's a scan on 23 TCP. But yeah, this graph just basically gives like, all, what's the unique IPs we are blocking. Now, here are the interesting graphs. So this is actually the week ending on August 7. Uh, I work late in the night, tell my boss this. So this actually is where it happened. So we were blocking about 6,000 IPs that day, and then all of a sudden there is this little spike happening on the week. And then if you see the month ending, this used to be the trend, and all of a sudden this is the big spike on August 11. So, so this actually gets us a little good idea about like, okay, what, uh, what is going on on the internet? It kind of gives you a weather report. Like overnight, boom, there is this increase in the scanning activity. And this is how we found Morto scanners. This is how we found those camera worms, because like, they just started scanning quickly. So, but uh, this was, oh. That was Sunday uh, of DEF CON. They I, dropped, I think so. Yeah, they dropped a bunch of uh, things to scan. They also talked about mass scan. OK. So, so a bunch of people implemented it. So you got hit by people implementing mass scan. Right, and they got hit by our blocking. So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, so that's good to know because I really did not have enough time to, and I hate like standing here and not knowing about what happened. But yeah, the characteristic was 23 TCP. Like so, uh, but this is actually this is how it looks. Like this is one hour, so it looks pretty flat. But when you look at this is one year, and see like all this craziness happening. 
So this is the latest one. So all these actually have, each one of them will have a story. So this system lets you get a good idea. Like one uh, was, somebody was scanning on MySQL, there was a big spike, and then like uh, three days later, there was some zero day exploit which emerged, uh, emerged for MySQL. This is like a year or two back. So now another thing to look at, uh, interesting is like not the volume, but the rate as well. So we look at the rate of the uh, ACL transactions, like how many blocks are we putting per minute, per second? So this gives you a rate, so generally you would do 60, uh, uh, but then these are where all the craziness starts happening. So then you actually see the rates going up to like 200, and this is where all the pages and the beeps start happening. And then you go back and see, okay, we blocked 100 IPs, but we blocked them in like one second. What happened all of a sudden? So that actually could have its own story coming. Okay, 15 minutes. So uh, again, this is the rate graph, literally just shows you a pretty good trend here. So again, there are some challenges, atomicity in the blocking, like okay, there are four blocking bros on the border, then there is like clusters which are blocking, then there is hard bleed dedicated bro which is blocking, then there is another bro, internal bro which would block. So there are all these different blocking happening. So as I said, bro actually fights with each other, they want to block before, so, but the, that's not a problem, that's a good thing. The problem is when they want to unblock. So, so that actually happened, and this was a very interesting failure condition. Let's see if I can explain it, otherwise read this slide again. So <laughs> we have SEC running, looking at the syslogs. Uh, SEC would see a brute force SSS scanner in the syslog, would go and block. And then SEC says, okay, I blocked this IP, I'm not gonna worry about it for one day. Bro A decides that, you know, this, block, uh, this IP scanned us, it saw 30 address scanner, and then it blocked, and then the timer expired, so bro, a actually said, okay, I'm going to unblock it. Uh, no, so bro A also goes and applies the block, but it thinks it actually, it fails because the SEC has already blocked. So there was a written code of like already blocked. So bro B's timer expires and it unblocks. Now the deal is SEC keeps thinking it has blocked the IP. Bro A thinks, okay, somebody else blocked the IP, so it doesn't block it till like next 12 hours or an amount of time, and then Bro B happily goes and unblocks it, and then the attacker just gets a whack, gets to whack at us for a few hours. So this was a, con like it happened once, and it was a pretty uh, disturbing condition to see. So we said, okay, let's actually address the issue. So there were some things we could actually do. So one was like, okay, can we have all the bros share state, and can we do that? So it became like, no, nah, that's too complicated code. Like we don't want this. Like, okay, one bro crashes, it actually sends a message, other one crashes, and then you don't, you don't want something like that. And it's difficult code, so uh, I can't write that one. So, and then like, okay, well, what about the another model where you have like an authoritative bro? All these boxes talk to one box, that guy decides to block or unblock, and then if it fails, there is another authoritative bro, and that would do it. That is also not quite there. It's a little involving. And then how would this all work with SEC? Like now, is SEC going to talk to authoritative bro? Is FireEye going to talk? So there were all these little questions coming up. And then again for unblocking, like okay, uh, I find like the hard bleed scanners thinks that we should block it for three months. And then scan detection says that we should block it for one day. So in unblocking, like both bros actually have a different timer. Now, who gets to win for unblocking? So it becomes like a lot of, uh, complications in this thinking. So we actually, like Craig is the guy who wrote TCP Dumb, uh, came up with this little idea. He said, you know, let's have these three written codes. If it's success, put zero. If it's failed, put one. If it's already blocked, then bro says, okay, it has already blocked by some other bro. I am not going to worry about the removal of the block. So that is, so whoever blocks manages it. And it's actually much simpler, right? Yeah. So, and I, I told Craig, like, Craig, I was thinking for two weeks and I came up with these strategies. And I draw a diagram on the board, and Craig is like, I had been thinking this for 10 years. So, <laughs> so yeah, and you just like, good job, Craig. So, so, so this is what we ended up doing here. It's like, okay, in restore, we would say, if it's existing, just return. It's dropped by else, don't worry about it. If it's failing, then let me know, like why would an attempt to draw, unblock would fail? This is, again, a little heavy code, but it's a pretty good, like an exec framework. This is how I'm exploiting the code. So if it's ex existing, then it's address already dropped, otherwise uh, it's address dropped by somebody else. Uh, if fails, send us a notification. 
So this is basically how internally we would work. If it's successful, then you say, okay, this particular address is wrong. So each bro like relies on the return code from ACL to make a decision on what it wants to do. And so this is actually, uh, so this allows all the bros to exist peacefully and not actually unblock or, so, so this graph is just the numbers where it says, okay, how many independent drops each bro of the external bro boxes did. So these are the unique IPs. So let's say if an IP was dropped by the uh, DMZ1, it won't get dropped by this one. But this is the overlap. So the numbers are like roughly 4, 6, 10, and I think uh, 30 or 40 when we had 54,000 IPs hit overnight. So the numbers here actually are that, okay, external DMZ acted on this IP and internal DMZ acted on the IP. That's shown by this. But generally what happens is one bro unblocked, five minutes later another bro blocked. So that's where both the bros touch this thing. So here are some things which are actually are like we want to keep in mind. Like when you are designing this system, this is like, like okay, let bro respect other bro when it comes to blocking and unblocking. And then use whitelist, use local nets, use neighbor nets. So that actually really helps. Like you don't really want to block uh, UCB down campus, so, but uh, you really don't want to give them free hand uh, the way we would like to give it to ESNet or NERSC. So put them in neighbor nets or just have different layers of it. And then there is functionality too. Like what if ACL has too many failures in blocking? What if it has too many success in blocking? We want to know this activity. So the system works pretty transparent, but these are the things which actually we want to like percolate up so that we can get uh, attention. So this is another thing which we do, a nightly report. And it gives us last 15 days of history, which it shows, like, okay, how many ACL transactions, how many unique IPs. So this is external bro one, two, internal bro one, internal two. So you see, like, the, these are the workhorses. The maximum drops happen here. Some still sneak in and happen here. And I think right now we attribute it just to the speed of light. So, like, okay, these, uh, like, before these react, these bro actually take action on it, but it's very less. So, and this is where the big numbers come up, like overnight you do like 20,000 unique IPs here, 36,000 unique IPs here. So this is, so when you see trends like this, then all of a sudden we know, so this is a good report to have. This is where, this is what help desk uses. Okay, uh, there is an IP which is blocked, somebody complains about it. Uh, you put the IP address here, you would know the reason why this happened. And then there's this entire story. Like this was null zeroed, it's not on whitelist, it's actually not wireless. So you'll get a story, they'll take care of blocking or letting us know if there is a problem. So what happens uh, when people cannot get here? This is an internal lab site. So if you are in a conference and you still get blocked. So, so Vince came up with this idea. And it's like you use connect.lbl.gov. This, this system runs outside our network. So you can still connect to here, you can actually give your public IP to us, and then you're like, okay, uh, I am having problems connecting to the lab, go here, give us the IP, read this, they know what to do with it. So now this is an interesting topic to stale management. Let's say we are blocking and blocking. Now Bro does a good job, but not perfect. There are times when you will have leaks, various conditions, restart, deleting of the uh, persistent file, there are all these little, little issues on things happening. So what do we do? So we actually have a stale management uh, lint job running, which actually says like, okay, check if this IP has been operated upon in the last seven days. If it's a success or ignore in block, we ignore it. Then we come up with a list of stale candidates here. And then we go through uh, like beginning of the time per se, like, which is like, okay, what are the logs we have? And try to identify what was the nature of this block. And then is it worthy to be unblocked? And then we actually classify and then we actually block. So going to beginning of time is relatively expensive. So we want to try to do this inside bro rather than doing it outside. So, but the, here is this little di uh, like uh, algorithm. So you take like, okay, what was the blocking agent? What was the block reason? And then you do an auto free and then we say, okay, this is an orphan. When we see these orphans, we go back to bro and try to figure out why this leak happened. Same thing here, like, okay, what was the blocking agent? This was an SSH brute force, and uh, we would auto-free that. So, so then there are like also uh, human blocks in there. So we don't want Bro to remove human blocks. We don't want uh, uh, any automation there. We want people to eyeball them. So this process actually like seeps out the human blocks for eyeballing. It actually would send us email, and it would bug us, like, okay, look at this block unblock it or let me know if this is worthy of a blacklist or a permanent block. So that happens. And then this particular approach allows us uh, to create and free 
new policies, like let's say we got ntp.bro, which is blocking. So now this is a new system. We want to make sure that it, a new system generally has a lot more stale IP addresses to be cleaned later on. So this system allows us that, okay, here is this new policy. It blocks so many, forgot about it. We get, uh, it comes back to our attention. So, uh, and as I always, like there is always a never ending wish list. It's like, okay, this system is good, but can we make it do these things? Can we make it do that thing? So one of the thing is like, can we like do dynamic responses? Let's say uh, 23 telnets can happen. Do we want 54,000 ACLs to actually go wasted on it? When we know that there are other bad things we should be blocking if, let's say, you have a limited budget. So can we change transition? Like, instead of doing a ACL block on fly after certain conditions meet, instead of ACL, you actually go for null zero blocking. Can you do this real time? Then can you also expire blocks on priority? Like, can Bro decide what's actually, so Bro says, OK, I have 60,000 IP addresses. I want to unblock them. And let's say the unblock timer is three months. Now, we are running short of ACL. Can Bro decide that, you know, ICMP scanners, low value. Let me unblock and free up ACL so that I can block uh, port 22 scanners or 33 scanners. So can we actually do that kind of expiration? Then can we do prioritization on the ports too? Like, OK, uh, all of a sudden, hard bleed vulnerability comes in. Now, I w if I have a decision on blocking 443 scanner or blocking uh, ICMP, I want to prioritize within Bro that Bro actually intelligently knows this is what is more critical. Let me block this beforehand. And then uh, another thing is like all these established connection protocols like RDP, SSH, blocking, unblocking. It becomes like, can you go inside these protocols and figure out how you can find badness the way we can do it in Heartbleed or uh, NTP? So, uh, and then uh, I think one interesting goal, and this is like, I think this is food for thought for all of you guys too, is like, can we figure out this intention of the scanner? Like, okay, why is the scanner scanning us? And can we make Bro actually tell what attackers know after the scanner? So like generally, they would see a dump on their screen which says vulnerable machines and then 10 IP addresses because they ran a pretty good scan. And then, okay, this Bro says, okay, this scanner, touched us, this is the report the scanners thought. So I think it would be a pretty good, uh, interesting thing. So all the slides in blue actually are uh, like what we want to attain and what we have been trying to attain. And all the slides in white actually are the ones which uh, shows the ways to do it. So you guys have any questions? Uh, anything for me? Sure. Have you done any long-term analysis on which IP addresses are problematic, get added and deleted? Yes, that's a good question. We are some toying with that idea. And the idea is actually using Bloom filters. Thank you, Matthias, for that one. So Bloom filters like basically take all the IP addresses which we have blocked at any given point of time, keep adding it to the Bloom filter. And then any time there is a new connection, we know that this was an IP which we blocked maybe three years back. And now uh, we make a decision like, okay, do we want, want to block it immediately or do you want to scrutinize this connection a lot more? So, so, so that is the approach we want to take. The, uh, the, the thing which actually, why is it not running or it's not on the slides here, is like, okay, can we make Bloom filters persistence? Can we make them actually expire, roll? How, what's the right way to do those things? So. so on your last slide, you mentioned being concerned about UDP spoofing. So for TCP, do you look for a three-way handshake before you block? No, or? not quite, actually. I mean, you can do that, too. So I should actually correct that and make it both. So that would be useful. So TCP, actually, uh, uh, you would block only on SYN scans, too. You don't really have to wait for an entire handshake to happen. And other thought for a smart defense for against spoofing for UDP? I guess you could technically look at TTLs and see how many hops they are away from you and see if it seems reasonable, but I can't think of offhand how to do it very quickly, right? Right, so with UDP scan, like every time we try to come up with it, it actually, the, I think the conversation goes is this is pretty difficult to figure out like what is a UDP scan, especially because like when you're doing grid FTP and doing all this different UDP port traffic, then all of a sudden it's like there's this too much uh, scan-like behavior happening, and we don't want to. So, so the premise, like, okay, the entire talk was about blocking, but the lab actually is like science first. 
We want to actually not to do things which actually interrupt. We want to keep the network open. So we're still in like very flux state, like, okay, how do we do it right? So. Thanks a lot. Questions, anybody else? All right, so feel free to talk to me later on, or if you have better ideas, thank you very much. So.